We're essentially taking people to places that you just get this sense of being somewhere quite primeval or Jurassic-like. Seeing these places, what they're like in reality versus the fantasy world of Lord of the Rings, it's just one of our best kept secrets, I suppose. My name is Stephanie and I work for 57 Hours. We believe in making the most of our outdoor time and that's kind of where we get our name. 57 Hours is the time from 3 p.m. Friday until midnight on Sunday that we have off. So we really like to make the most of that time and go on adventures, go outside. Of course, going to somewhere like New Zealand might take more than just a weekend, but we really truly believe in that time off. Other things that we really believe in is we really try to commit to our guides and our environment and sustainability. We have our 1% initiatives and that helps 57 Hours give back to guides, um, just like Daniel and Grace, and give back to our environment as well. So with no further ado, I think we're going to jump right in. We have Daniel and Grace, they're joining us from their home country of New Zealand. Oh, kia ora, everyone. It's great to be here and talk about New Zealand and hopefully inspire some of you to come over and visit us. And also, yeah, thanks to 57 Hours, it's a great opportunity for us to be able to connect with you through 57 Hours. You know, it's often really hard for us to let people know, you know, that we're here and what we're doing. So we're really excited about this collaboration with 57 Hours and looking forward to the summer ahead. A bit about me, I'm actually one of the co-owners of Hiking New Zealand. I first started with the company about 22 years ago, actually, as a guide, which was a really nice progression for me to the stage. Along with my wife, we were able to buy into the business and take a more sort of active role in steering the business um, where we wanted it to go. So my role here, I design a lot of the itineraries. I'm very involved in the operational side of things with the guides, but I still love guiding trips myself. And yeah, I love sharing those stories or spinning yarns. And I'm a committed conservationist and care deeply about the land here. So yeah, I'd like to introduce you to Grace now. Grace has been with us for a few years now, and she's been a key part of our conservation team, and we're excited to be getting her back out guiding this summer. Yeah, kia ora. Yeah, I've been really excited to have the pivot into conservation work and, and also back into this guiding work. It's been a few years. In these last few years, I've ended up going back to university to become a nurse. So that's been this whole other adventure. But I'm looking forward to the summer where I can have some other diversity come into my life. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. So what we're going to cover this morning, just want to start off by just giving you a bit of a, an overview of logistics um, New Zealand. I'm going to talk about the ultimate North Island trip, which is one of our signature trips. This particular style of travel that is something that we've evolved over the years where we're essentially traveling through the country and we're linking up national parks with amazing multi-day hikes and taking people to places that they wouldn't have got to without a guide, places they might not have heard of, or maybe just logistically it's kind of too difficult, but also taking you to those iconic destinations which you've probably heard of and seen imagery of so it's just we're always working hard to try and craft that blend of the places which you're coming to see that you've heard of but these gems these delighters which are kind of more like locals spots if you like and then yeah we'll talk about things you need to bring with you what you can hire off us and go through some dates and what we've got on offer before we have some questions at the end so how big is New Zealand? Yeah, we just put this overlay map here of it in Europe. Yeah, we think of New Zealand as, you know, when we look at a world map, it's this sort of tiny dot down the bottom of the world, but it's actually still quite a, a sizable and vast country, or particularly when you're getting out and hiking in the wilderness. It's 1,600 kilometres long and 400 kilometres wide at its widest point, but quite sparsely populated. We've got a population of 5.1 million and of that 1.6 live in, in Auckland. It's not hard to find big, wild, unspoiled, unpopulated, wide open spaces in New Zealand. New Zealand or Aotearoa, which is what it's the Māori name for New Zealand and more and more is referred to as Aotearoa alongside New Zealand or just by itself. So that's pretty cool. Um, we're very kind of in touch with our indigenous language here. The translation of that is the land of the long white cloud. 
I actually really love this slide here on a classic swing bridge. But one thing that's unique about New Zealand is geographically, when New Zealand was formed, it broke off from Gondwana land like a raft out in the sea, and it's had 80 million years of isolation. So if you imagine the plants and animals that were on that raft when it broke off, they've had no, I guess, influence from other plants or species from other land masses, apart from things that got sort of blown onto it. So we haven't had mammals. So a lot of the plants and animals that you find here are endemic or they're you know, found nowhere else in the world. When you're hiking through like the Furunaki forest, which Grace will take you through later, you just get this sense of being somewhere quite primeval or Jurassic-like. So it's pretty, pretty cool. And a third of New Zealand is actually protected as national parks and or reserves and administered by the Department of Conservation. And with that goes a vast network of tracks and backcountry huts. So it really is a, a hiker's paradise. Not only there's so much land that's under protection, but open to public access, there's this really intricate network of tracks and infrastructure to enable people to get out and enjoy the um, backcountry. In terms of getting around in New Zealand, you know, we're only a small population, so we don't have a big infrastructure of public transport. So it is quite difficult to get to some of these remoter areas and our national parks if you're relying on public transport. So you really need to be kind of independent in that sense, have transport or join a tour and get a guide so you can get out to these really special places. So our landscapes are really varied in New Zealand. And I think for touring around, that's what makes it really cool. You know, you can be hiking in this subtropical rainforest and then come out back in the bus and drive, you know, three hours down the road and you're in the central plateau, a volcanic plateau, which is this lunar-like landscape, almost desert-like. I always say to people, enjoy the hiking when we're out in the wilderness, but enjoy the journeys between these destinations because it's a beautiful country for doing road trips and you won't get bored because the landscape changes so frequently. The best time to visit New Zealand? Well, I mean, any time is better than no time, but most popular months for hiking are coming in late October, early November, so it's our spring, and right through to late April into our autumn or fall. In a reasonably temperate climate, so the winters aren't that harsh, but up in the mountains where some of our trails are, they do get um, restricted by snow and the passes uh, become you know, too difficult to cross in those winter months between you know, June and sort of into early October. But there are other regions that um, are less affected, the more lower-lying coastal regions. Yeah, I mean, I can't stress enough, I suppose, if you're coming to New Zealand, just get off the beaten track, you know, take the back roads, meet the locals, even better, go with a guide so you don't miss what you've come to see. New Zealand is a you know, very diverse country. It's not always easy, I suppose, to know, you know where to go when you're somewhere new. It's worth making an effort to turn off the main drag and um, go for a real explore. Yeah, way, actually way back when I started guiding 22 years ago, we were just coming off the back of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And it was really huge at the time. I remember back around 2000, 2001, we were just constantly putting on these extra trips because um, New Zealand just was suddenly on the map with the backpacker market. And, um, and it was all through Lord of the Rings. People are always so interested in seeing these places, what they're like in reality versus you know, in the fantasy world of Lord of the Rings. We're going to overview the itinerary a little bit. I'm going to hand over to Grace to take us through that more. Where I'll start with this is saying that I'm from the North Island, Dan is as well. This place is really special to me and my family history is really interwoven between like the European and Maori histories and interaction through the time. So our journey, it starts from Auckland, which is where I grew up. And we travel through all these cool in-between places. So we travel towards Rotorua and then sort of out east from there into some pretty wild lands and then come back in towards the central plateau around Lake Taupo, Tongarero, which is where all the volcanoes are, active volcanoes. And then we come on down to the capital city, Wellington. There is so many magical places to be found in between and we're pretty lucky in that we are able to see some of these like amazing places through this tour. 
Yeah, we're studying in Auckland or Tamaki Merkoro, which is also the city of sales. It's where the America's Cup races raced and it's the biggest city. And it's also the largest Polynesian city in the world. So New Zealand was the last island that was settled by the great Pacific of Polynesian navigators. And to give context to that, New Zealand culture and the mythology that we still learn about and are guided by from the interwoven Māori aspect of our culture is very much connected to the Pacific. And so some of you may have seen Moana, the Disney movie, or you may have spent some time in New Zealand, or you may have spent some time in the Pacific Islands. But Maui is a demigod, and I certainly grew up learning all about those stories. The North Island itself is known as Tiaka o Maui, or the fish of Maui. And the story goes that Maui pulled a great fish from the sea, and that is what made the land. As we travel, everywhere we go, there are these stories, and it helps us to understand how to interact and respect the land as well. So as we travel towards, say, the volcanoes, there are certain like cultural beliefs are not about not like standing on the heads of the warrior mountains. The North Island or like New Zealand as well was the last country that was colonized by the British Empire as well. So it was like the last of a lot of things. And I think as a result of that, we do have like a real bicultural influence in this country. So Māori language and English is spoken and you'll find we will often go between the languages and our way of seeing the world is a little more collective and probably grounded by like collective Māori ways of being in the world. So our travels going from Auckland through the Waikato towards Rotorua and along the way it follows a lot of old trading paths and war paths and the Māori people are great strategists and during the times of colonization around like the 1860s 1870s they were Māori people who were fighting back were big into the trench warfare and so along our journey we can see some of this landscapes like this place called Te Porere. and so we might stop and check out these places along the way. It's really easy to drive past them without the knowledge so it's one of those things where having somebody with you can really, who, who knows the landscape, can bring the land alive in that way. So on the first day, we head towards Rotorua. This place is not only the central place of Māori culture, it is also very actively geothermal. And to be driving down the road and there's steam coming out of people's fences and bubbling mud across the road and occasionally a house disappears or like parts of it might like fall into a hole that has appeared like a sinkhole and it smells like sulfur so, so you can really smell it coming before you actually get there but we stopped there briefly to have a picnic by one of the many crater lakes and again like this whole area is volcanically active and the landscape is dotted with volcanoes and old craters that are now lakes. So we stop, we have a picnic and we pack up and we get ready to go into the Fidanaki, which is our first night. And it can be a quite a big day, but it's such a worthwhile day. Like there's a lot of anticipation and people getting to know each other still. And Rotorua itself is is a real tourist hub, but not very far away at all, is the Fidanaki. And we start up in the subalpine, which is these trees that look like truffula trees, like from Dr. Seuss. And all these big old trees like this in the picture here. And we sort of descend down. And before guiding with Hiking New Zealand, I'd never been out to this area. I'd known about it as one of these far-flung places and as a place that was steeped in a lot of natural history and also like recent like environmental activism history and a bid to protect from deforestation. But yeah, coming out here, it feels so far away and so peaceful and it's full of birds and full of massive trees and all this undergrowth, hundreds of different types of ferns and lichens and spleenworts and flowering trees and vines and epiphytes that all hang in different ways from all these trees. So it feels very subtropical. Yeah, like a fairyland in some ways. Yeah, further to what Grace was saying, on our trips, I suppose, we're always trying to, when we design our 
our itineraries to try and get you into the wilderness to get your hiking as soon as possible and Grace and I while doing this webinar it was pretty cool to just share some experiences of people's reaction on that first day of the trip you know they might have only arrived into the country the night before and then that night you of the next day you've got a pretty big day traveling from Auckland and then a, a hike of two or three hours but then you're sort of deep in this primeval rainforest and it just feels like another world and just to give you some context you know the Furunaki it is a really out of the way place you could probably ask the average New Zealander if they'd been there and that they probably mightn't have even heard of it it's just one of our best kept secrets I suppose yeah, pretty cool at the end of that first day and you're sitting around the fire and just seeing people's reactions of it just all sort of soak in this environment that they're in. Yeah, it's very rewarding as a guide. So when we come out of the Fidanaki, there's a really beautiful walk out down through the valley and it is a very exciting, um, very narrow, windy, gravelly road into a place that was the last place that European people came to or didn't really settle here but made an appearance at. The Tuhoi tribe that is of this place have been able to regain a lot of autonomy of their life, their way of living and this land. Back in 2014, this whole landscape here, it became, it got human rights attached to it. So it has the same rights that a human does. So respect and autonomy and being able to speak up. So it aligns a lot more with a Maori way of seeing land as a living, breathing thing. So this area is really special. Again, prior to guiding, I'd never been out here. It was one of these places that's always been known about through history. Yeah, the journey in itself is like its own experience for sure but we come into this beautiful spot called Lake Waikari Moana and usually in the afternoon we go on a little hike around and check it out a little bit but something that's really like notable for me about this area is just how incredibly peaceful it is it's like there is a spirit in that air for me it always makes me feel like I've come home in some sort of way. Dan has this little clip here and it just shows a spot of like where we camp and there's these really cool little cabins that we get to stay in. This is one of the many beautiful places that we might go and check out. Again, this whole area is really wild. We spend a couple of days here and the landscape is again really different. So the forest has changed. It's not quite the same as the Fidanaki. It's a little more scrubby and a little less like old growth forest. And that's just the landscape itself. And then you can see on this photo here, there's this bay that goes in and then this big ramp and that's called the Panakiri Ridge. And we actually go up there. And what makes it really a special place is not only that, again, compared to the Fidanaki or anywhere else that we've been, the rock type is limestone and it's been pushed up from the ocean. So like all the things that have died and like, you know, gone to the sea and turned to rock. And so there's cave systems all through here. But as you go up this ridge, the forest goes from the subtropical podocarp forest and then turns into beech forest, which is a whole different type of forest. This would be like the podocarp forest with all the epiphytes and the vines and the ferns and everything like that. So that's lower down and then going up, which sometimes can be a little bit misty like this, it turns into beach forest. And beach forest in the North Island is, is actually not very common. We do find it again in the central plateau in Tongarero, but it's otherwise like more predominant in the South Island because they prefer like higher and drier landscapes. I think these photos of the mist are really appropriate for Te Urawera. So Tuhoi, the name of that also means children of the mist. Beautiful day to be up here. It really is. Sometimes a perfectly blue sunny sky just washes everything yes. out. I like the cloud action. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have this disease? 
So I believe some of these these trees here, they were burnt in a bit of a fire at some point in time. And then it's all regenerated back up around them. But this is this is what we get to travel through. And I guess it shows like a good indication of the New Zealand track as well. Yeah, we, we definitely experience like a bit of a range of either well-maintained and also like not. So it, it creates a cool adventure in that way. On the way up Panakiri Ridge, there's all these places where you look out it's amazing and you really do feel like you're at the top of a cliff. My most favorite part of this part of the country is that coming down from the ridge there is this cave system and after a hot day of hiking and feel like you've gotten a little bit sunburned there is this whole area with these little trails through it of these nice shady cool slightly damp caves just to travel through. I think the other thing about the case is it was like a place that um, as far as the outlaws go, it was an area that a lot of them would go to and like hide in. You see that low grassy, that's all that pampas, yeah the pampas grass. I thought it was down in there. Yeah. So again we're still traveling through these all these like secret stash locations of the central North Island and we return back towards Rotorua en route to Whakapapa and for some people that's a really funny sounding name but essentially it just translates to genealogy that is what that word means so on the way we do get to stop and check out a bit of bubbling mud and hang out in some of the hot springs that are free and if you know the places to go then it's awesome and a lot of people don't really go there so we often just have like a little space to ourselves and it's a really nice way just to yes yeah, soothe the muscles for the next round so there is hot springs and then lake taupo as well as we journey forward oh there's also the hooker falls sometimes we'll just stop and go for a wander around here and this is pretty a pretty epic river system this all this water comes out of lake taupo which is this massive crater lake and it's also the first recorded eruption in the world i think it happened about 186 ad and the records are in like japan and greece and all over like all up in the north because they lost all their sunlight for about a month because of this massive explosion the crater like it's geothermal so the water's not all that cold so it's amazing to have like an evening swim and a bit of a picnic on the side and i particularly like this so this is um this is at Taranaki Falls most people have heard of the Tongariro Alpine Crossing which is a day hike very famous and an incredible hike which we come on to from yeah a bit of a, a back door i suppose but um there's also the amazing little shorter hikes and we do this one on the day that we start our multi-day hike and it's taranaki falls we do like three days of the four days of what is the known as the Northern Circuit, a great walk. And we start out from Whakapapa where we stay at this really nice hostel called the Scotch House. So we like start there and go out and then we end there with, you know, some beers and a nice restaurant meal at the end, which is always pretty fun. The landscape changes so much. So this is the Rangapo Desert here, which is like volcanic plains. And this is all native tussock lands tussock grasses and the first day it can be so hot and people inevitably get burnt the burn time in New Zealand's like five minutes because we don't have much of an ozone layer so it can be a bit of a challenge but it's beautiful and we often get to Waihohonu hut and the feet are a bit sore and the sunburns might be giving a bit of grief but this hut here is my favorite thing about this area here is it's surrounded by beech forest and just down below is this amazing river to swim in and just like cool down after that day and I always camp down there and anyone else is just you know if you wanted to take a tent and a lot of people do just like camp down by the river the landscape is pretty rocky so all of these volcanoes through here are like truly active they are well monitored by the GNS so it's like the geologic 
science surveying company so they're always just ensuring that people aren't like in an area if there's going to be an eruption but there has been in the past not when we're there but this whole landscape you can probably tell but they're all like old like lava flows and we travel off trail through a lot of this area because it's like amazing open country for it so if you've never done off trail travel this is like a really cool experience to have for it. and if you have then awesome just more opportunity for you we travel around the mountains it's the mount nora hoi covered in snow there which is also mount doom to anyone who's super into lord of the rings so this whole area was like part of that that part of the lord of the rings there we do stay in another hut or camp and i'm gonna say right now it's probably my most favorite hut in the whole of New Zealand to go to purely because it sits on this this big ridge and you get views out across the North Island there is this river not too far away again to cool off and you have to take this slightly dodgy steep track down to it but it's all like waterfalls and plunge pools with floating pumice where you can just like give yourself a nice exfoliation and just like be in the water and it's summertime and the water is perfect temperature and then coming back to the hut every single time I've been there I've made friends with the other hikers like ended up making these friends we make this like big group meal and then end up sharing it with all these new friends that we've made so it's quite a special experience like one of those nights where you go away and you're like wow that was just like a there was a really cool interaction with like people of the world, like locals and international people and all versions of the people. The final day is coming up over the Tongariro crossing. So the previous photo was like coming up and you come up to here to the woods, the Emerald Lakes. We don't drink from them, but they're really pretty to look at. There can be even in summertime snow up there. It can be pretty exposed. And occasionally if the weather is bad because it's like an alpine environment and it can get pretty gnarly. So sometimes we might have to like peel out and, and go the low way out. You can kind of see on this photo, there's like a faint path that goes the other, like out, out, up towards the, the left-hand corner. But where all the people are on this picture here, the best thing about the way that we do the Northern Circuit is all the people who are doing just the day crossing, they've all gone already. So you don't end up having this whole stream of people to have to go against the current with. We generally get to just have it to ourselves and then right at the top of the ridge, so this is like my most favorite thing to do. There is hot, like warm rocks up there because it's all volcanic. So you just sit on a warm rock right on the ridge and eat a really good sandwich, usually a bacon sandwich for me. And it's pretty rough terrain. So you have to be like prepared for it. So a good hiking pole, good boots. Another hoi, which is Mount Doom and the red. So it'll be oxidization from all the various like minerals, like iron. And that's why we get all those interesting colors. It's just like oxidization of minerals, various types of minerals. Beyond it is Ruapehu, which is another active volcano and has a bunch of ski fields on it and glaciers as well, which I think is pretty cool. It's like an active volcano with glaciers. They do erupt. So I remember in 97 when Ruapehu was erupting and they had to get all the people in the towns all surrounding this area evacuated from their homes and there is a story that there was a scout group that were a little bit behind and they were up in that crater basin and were pretty much just like hanging out like hiding behind big boulders and they're all like fine they all survive yeah pretty scary but that won't happen to us the technology these days is pretty good but yeah, we come back around in the Skotel. This is like a view from the Skotel. So you're likely to have a, a room that has this, this sort of view. One final farewell glimpse of Tongariro before we head south. Yeah. And this is the capital city, Wellington. For those who are familiar with San Francisco, I always think that it's got sort of like similarities in its architecture and lay of the land. But yeah, that's where the tour finishes, but it's it can be picked up with the southern part as well for further journeys south. And I think Dan can speak further to that. 
Yeah, backcountry huts. We've got a thousand backcountry public huts in New Zealand. And so they're a real asset, a real treasure, if you like. And so a big part of this trip is using these huts. It becomes one of the highlights of the trip, but it's always rewarding and fun in the people you meet, the conversations you have. So our huts, a lot of them sort of originated from huts that were built by the government for hunting way back in the 1950s. So the government employed people to go and live in the mountains to hunt deer just because they've become like plague proportions. So they built these huts to house those hunters so they could live out in the mountains. So some of them have got their origins from that. And also tramping clubs would often build their own hut. Over time, they've been sort of absorbed in the, into the Department of Conservation Estate and now um, you know, upgraded and open for all. We've got safety written up there, but being safe is all about bringing the right gear. And these two photos here, they could well be taken on the same day, but they're not in this particular case. But you know, New Zealand weather, the key thing, it's really changeable. And especially in a place like Tongariro, you're on a plateau on these mountains. Any weather coming in is, you know, these mountains are just a, a magnet for it. So that weather changes very quickly. So you want to, yeah, we always talk about layers, you know, first and foremost, you've got to have a good raincoat, not some sort of ski jacket type thing you need a waterproof Gore-Tex or similar raincoats sort with of three layer type thing that's going to keep you wet uh, keep you dry when you're carrying a pack and it's and when it's raining hard and underneath that you need a, a layering system of yeah you know, something that's thermal so not cotton merino wool is really good or also you know something synthetic like polypropylene or something like that but but then you can see you know you could be like that in the morning and then in the afternoon you're getting sunburn so that's being prepared for those four seasons in one day and we'll take you through the needed gear that you need to enjoy a hike um, with us in New Zealand and there's a bit of a, a list there we actually yeah, hire out some of those bigger items often people are traveling off to other destinations afterwards like Asia or something where they don't want to be carting around sleeping bags and all that warm gear. So it's no problem to hire equipment off us as well. We travel with a customized trailer, which has got space for the luggage, which is all sort of locked away. So you can leave your stuff that you don't need for the hike locked in there. So you, yeah, you don't need to worry about that. Food, our guides do a big shop before the trip and then during the trip we're we're replenishing. So if you've got dietary requests, just let us know and your guide will, will just check in with you. And then when they're doing those shops, I'll just make sure that they're getting appropriate food for you. Yeah, and very importantly, New Zealand's a land of birds. There are no snakes. Sand flies that bite, and I did notice a, a question about that in the comment about mosquitoes. Generally, it's the sand flies, the little black flies that annoy us. You know, sort of further north in New Zealand, you get a few mosquitoes, but Generally, they're not too bad. So your skills and your know, prerequisites, you know, we don't say that you need to be an experienced hiker because you know, we've, we're providing a guided, guided service. We want to you know, make this accessible for a range of people. So you know, typically on a trip, we would have people that are quite experienced and would have people that are quite new to hiking. So we can make that work. Obviously, if you're new to hiking, you need to be fit enough to walk on average of four to five hours a day. But bearing in mind that the, the longest day, you might be on your feet walking for up to eight hours. And the terrain is, it's not all well-groomed trails. It's, you're going to be walking over tree roots, rocks. We recommend using a walking pole to give you a bit more confidence there. And you're going to have a backpack on. We say carrying a 10 to 12 kg backpack, you're not going to be carrying that weight of backpack all day, every day. It's just at the start of a, say, three-day hike when we're all loaded up with everything we need. That's when our packs will be at their heaviest. And then, of course, as we work through our provisions and food, it, it gets lighter. And our guides always go through exactly what you need um, you know, the essential items that you need in your pack before we set off, just to make sure you don't you know, start a hike with way more weight on your back than what you need. But most importantly is having um, yeah, a great attitude. And environmentally and sustainably, I just wanted to introduce you to Tiaki Promise, which is something, as a tourism operator, something we abide by and invite all our guests to um, buy into as well. This is a sort of a collaboration, I guess, between yeah, the people of New Zealand and Tourism New Zealand 
just about traveling responsibly and sustainably, I guess, in New Zealand. And the promise is that while traveling in New Zealand, I will care for land, sea and nature and tread lightly, leaving no trace. I'll travel safely, showing care and consideration for all in our respect culture, traveling with an open heart and an open mind. Yeah, we think that's really cool. And that just sort of really sums up how we travel and how we conduct ourselves when running our trips. Just sort of touching on some details here, we've talked about a trip called the Ultimate North Island. There's also another North Island trip, which is a hotel-based trip. So it's a, so instead of doing the multi-day hikes, you stay in hotels in the evening and do a, a series of day hikes as we we'll follow a sort of a similar route through the country. And that, that trip is five days. The Ultimate North is eight days. And our, we've got tours scheduled between December and March. And just the other day, we've had some space come up available on the Ultimate South, which is a South Island trip of 15 days that carries on from the Ultimate North. And they are our last spots for the season. They're in, in March. Prices there, um, $16.85 US per person for the Ultimate North Island and $2,440 US dollars per person for the hotel-based tour, which we refer to as the Uncut. We're 11 people and one guide on the Ultimate, and 13, up to 13 and two guides on the hotel-based tour. It's just about everything's included. We include most meals, but then sometimes we'll get to a destination where there might be a few restaurants on offer. And so we'll just make those nights where people can just go out and have a bit of freedom and check out a lo local restaurant, which isn't included. All accommodations, transportation, all those guided hikes and the activities outlined in the itinerary. We'll go to Waiatapu where that boiling mud is, that's included. And on our hotel-based truck, we have a Māori village experience where you go and experience a kapa haka and enjoy a hungi meal, which is a traditional Māori way of cooking food in the earth. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your time.